Let's collect some uh, some other questions and comments. And uh, I hope it's okay. You're all going to be videotaped when if you give a comment. So we we need you to speak into the mic, and we'll be bringing around a microphone for anyone who wants to speak. So questions, comments, or are you all just in agreement with both of the speakers? Well, why don't you start? Since you've got the mic, you might as well use it. All right. Um, I'm David, graduate student in philosophy here. I just had a curiosity about the none of the above voting. If none of the above got more votes than any individual candidate, would you then like have a new election, or is it just like a protest vote? Mm-hmm. Okay. That's it. I will answer that. Yes, okay. <laughs> you can answer if you want. I right think. now? Yeah, we could, we could start that way and then... Okay, well, there are two... Again, it's, it's, it's a little bit like we just mentioned in terms of participatory budgeting. They're different formats, so to speak. The one... That bring the one that I think the first one was the city of St. Petersburg had this. And in that case, uh, if none of the above won, and that happened in three successive elections in the university district of St. Petersburg, I'm told, uh, <clears throat> then you had to have another election. Right? Otherwise, no, it just goes recorded as that. And I think in Moldova, there are no immediate consequences. It's simply a kind of message of alienation, let's call it. So, again, there's a variation, just as there's a lot of variation in participatory voting in terms of how binding the decisions are, et cetera. We could go into that maybe if we have more time. Question behind it. Please Question identify for, yourself as well. Uh, Professor Schmitter, <clears throat> there are two deficits that most observers talk about and with respect to the European Union. One is the democratic deficit that you have um, uh, explored, and the other is the executive deficit. The two are obviously related. You can't have democracy unless you have an, an, indep- an autonomous executive power. Uh, the parliamentary power is not the problem. It's the executive power. So I wanted to ask you, especially since your topic is the future of democracy, and let's say in the European Union, What do you think are the prospects, realistically, of creating an autonomous executive power independent of the political leadership of the member states? Am I to answer this right away? Well, this issue has come up. And the problem right now is exactly the opposite of what you said. There are four presidents. So you have... You have... Four executive powers, depending on whether you're talking about the Commission or the Council of Ministers or the European Council, and there's another one somewhere. I can't remember. But there are four guys, and they're all men at this point, wandering around, all calling themselves president inside the EU. So that's a little – but your point is well taken because precisely this – and then they they don't know – what their respective responsibilities. They fight, they spend more time fighting with each other over turf than, you know, anything else because the, the, the rules are so vague that no one knows exactly who should be. As, this is becoming very, very important with this euro crisis in terms of what, who, which institutions are going to be assigned, which kinds of responsibility, et cetera. So now <clears throat> the suggestion has been made and roundly rejected to have direct elections for the president of the European Council, right? And to transform the Council of Ministers into a second chamber, Senate-like chamber, right? There's one extremely good reason why this will never happen. There are too many Germans. Germans. (laughs) If the EU were a bunch of countries of more or less the same size, okay, kind of imagine it, I guess. The problem is, and it'll it'll get worse if Turkey becomes a member, which I don't think is going to happen, incidentally, but if it did, because the Turks within 10 years, I think, are going to be even larger than the Germans, right? So that's the problem. Nobody, now, I had suggested the other day when we were discussing exactly this issue, somebody brought this up, and I said, this is a non-starter, forget about it. It's not, not only, of course, our national executive is not going to, but the main reason they can publicly oppose it is that too damn many Germans and therefore if the Germans had a candidate and you have a number of countries which depend very closely on Austria for example not to mention a few others in the east uh, they would win automatically so to speak every election what I proposed 
I don't know how many of you heard of the Euro Song Contest. Does that exist in the United States? No, it doesn't, right? That's a European thing. Anyway, the rules of voting in the Euro Song Contest is you cannot vote for a singer or group from your own country. So you can't vote. All Germans, they can't vote for a German singer or a German group. They have to vote for, it's the most wonderful thing to watch. If you're ever in Europe, forget about the songs, they're awful, I think. But, but, the, but the, the strategic voting that takes place, right? Because you can't vote for your own country, and therefore the question is, who can you vote who's going to be the weakest candidate against your candidate? So you vote strategically, so to speak, to ensure that your candidate will win without voting for your candidate. Right? It's, it's very clever. So, but they didn't like that either. I mean, the, God, the people who were proposing it said, no, that, that robs it of its. But th that, th there might be a format in which you can neutralize the size of Germany and its predominance, of course, economically and its more or less uh, you know, dependent neighbors, etc. But for that reason, at least if it's presidentialism. Now, the usual formula, of course, is that the European Union would become parliamentary eventually. And therefore, you would have a prime minister based on a coalition government and based on a double vote of confidence in a parliament and a Senate. But you don't have the Senate yet, so to speak. So that's, I think that's much more likely direction, but you're still a long way away from it. At the present moment, there are too many executive powers <laughs> in the European Union for any of them to be able to assert any kind of leadership, if you want to call it that. Okay, I'm going to jump in since I don't, uh, after, um, uh, with a couple of uh, questions. Um, one is sort of silly, but I'm, <laughs> with respect to your uh, universal citizenship, um, which of the parents gets to uh, <laughs> do the vote, and what happens if they don't agree? <laughs> do they take? Um, well, that they was kind of not a serious. A coin. I'm just assuming I they see. would. The big problem, no. The Let big... the kid be a tiebreaker between the parents. <laughs> Okay, that wasn't my serious question. Uh, I would I have to say that when I first proposed this, somebody stood up and said, do you know what you're doing? You're reinventing the Austro-Hungarian Empire. I looked horrified, of course. It turns out that the voting in Austro-Hungarian part, the pater familias, had as many votes as he had family members. Right, so well, it did remind me of I John Stuart Mill. Sons, yeah. Not, Illegal ones, too. But anyway, so you had block voting, so to speak, in which the, the, only the male, of course, and the right. property owners, right. right, could vote. But they could vote nine times if they had eight kids and a wife, right? So I was accused of reinventing the Australian mm. Empire, but that's not what well, I Well, two things. I would, like you, I would like to hear your response to Mike Menzer's um, sort of questions, challenges from the standpoint of – uh, the role of democracy outside of politics and whether uh, you think that that is um, a serious contender. And the other, um, the other thing that interests me is in your paper you make several um, suggestions with, that involve um, you know, e-voting kinds of, or um, deliberation online and um, kiosks. I wasn't sure what you had in mind for that. Um, where well, people exists. could vote. Yes, but is that like instead of electronic voting or in addition or... No, they're all, you know... Like, but if you want, I wanted just an elaboration of the role of um, online deliberation and voting as you right, see it. Right. Okay, but let's, let's go back to what I think was the central yeah. thrust of yeah, uh, Michael's true. comments, and I think they were well taken. I mean, this it was something written for a body of 53 member states, uh, states, I repeat. So uh, it, it's, it is statist, if you see what I mean. It is organized around the idea, and I don't think in Europe you can get away from that, to tell the truth. I mean, uh, that, so it was, it, it in a sense, accepts the state format while recognizing the transformations that are taking in the nation and the nature of those states in their subnational units and in the supranational units. So it's not statist in the completely orthodox sense that it's only focused on the politics of the member, the, the national governments of the member states, but it is, it, it says, given this state and given the fact that politics will be channeled through the state that the state will remain, and that depends on what level, the authoritative allocator of values, as dear old David Easton used to call it, right? So that is assumed, right? 
The second thing <clears throat> that I think differs uh, is that we do not have uh, the same kind of uh, – we, we say something about participatory voting, but we don't take it seriously, if you see it. There's lots of experimentation with it. There's as much going on in Europe, perhaps, now as, as anywhere in, in participatory voting. But we sort of – Excuse me, participatory budgeting, yes, excuse me. That, 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 so in a sense, we, that was going on and there wasn't a lot to add, so we just simply mm -hmm. mentioned it. But what is different about the entire approach, I think, is it goes back to one of those revolutions. That is, the approach is focusing mostly on the behavior of organizations, either institutions in relation to political parties, or in, you know, so individuals, citizens, play a role, but they play a role in representative, in representational structures. So the idea that direct represent, especially on the scale, because most, almost all the ones you're talking about, are on a relatively modest scale. So that's, so to speak, back in the history of democracy. But as soon as you go over a certain scale. Then now the only way you could do that, and we did talk a lot about this, and we have one. I have one idea in there, which I'm surprised you didn't pick up because it fits nicely with what you were talking about. The only way to resolve that <clears throat> is by random choice, mm -hmm. right? So if you could create publics by random selection, then you could, so to speak, downsize these large units. And if the public would recognize, which is a Big question mark. We don't know how much the public understands about random choice, whether they would accept, so to speak, the opinion of a randomly selected group as somehow, uh, I won't say binding, but, you know, worthy of consideration or whatever. We don't know that for sure. Well, we do with juries. In the United States, the jury system would constitute a form, that kind of form. Yeah. Yeah, but that's not for the whole national. I mean, oh, no, I'm just saying I, mean it's, I understand it's that, of course, yeah. the jury system. Yeah. But in this, we have one proposal that is exactly in your line. We call it citizens' assembly. Did you catch that one? Mm -hmm. The citizens' assembly would be a randomly selected group from a national population, maybe a municipal one. I don't care what the level is. Even Europe as a whole. In fact, we've had one randomly selected group of Europeans that met in in, in, in Brussels, and. <clears throat> But their purpose would be precisely as a counterweight to professional politicians. So what would happen in this case is that every year you would have a third assembly, essentially, during the recess of the lower house. You would have a random selection, and you'd have as many members as exist in the lower house randomly selected from the same constituencies, mm -hmm. right? And their job because you can't expect them to initiate legislation, you can't expect... Their job would be to pass judgment on one or two pieces of legislation which had been assigned to them by a minority of a certain size, let's say one-third of the votes of the lower chamber. So if there was a tax reform bill, let's say, passed by 51% or whatever the rules are, and there were... Then that tax bill would have to be justified before a randomly selected group of citizens mm -hmm. over a period of time. Right? But you can't expect them to do more than one bill, so to speak. I mean, right? And they would be paid the exact same salaries as deputies for that particular point in time. So they would have the, the status and resources. That was the so to the extent that we come close to thinking about participatory, we, we insist very much on the importance of random selection because all of the research I've seen, Porto Alegre and other places in Brazil, as you point out, it's all over Brazil now. Mm -hmm. um, well, anyway, I'll, I'll talk to you about that. Um, the problem, of course, is that the basis of participation is self-selection. And that's not a random bunch of citizens. So you do not get a random bunch of citizens. You get a very heavy predominance of people who think they know how to argue well, who are better educated, among other things, right? So uh, Really, that's not true in Brazil, but there's it a... There's it a, is, no, well, no, give me the research. Heller, no. Yeah, because no, that, in the, what happened early, especially early on in Porto Alegre, is the rich didn't feel that they could exercise their influence through participatory budgeting, so they went back through patronage channels 
and they stopped attending the principal board budget meetings. No, they signed up, but, so, but there are other there are other experiments. And but I'm just telling you that yeah, that has been a standard problem. It's, it's it, unless you uh, both pay people, right? and select them randomly or in some kind of principle that breaks with it. But as soon as you base these citizen groups on self-selection, you have a real problem, it seems to me. So you have to think of some other way, at least if you're concerned with the citizenship aspects, rather than, again, stakeholders. Who will show up are stakeholders as a rule, people who have some kind of special claim for whatever it is you're discussing. Yeah, I think the participatory, participatory budgeting has innovative, again, it depends on the country, mechanisms to address that. And one of the, one of the ways they address it is through the displacement of the power of political parties and those other kinds of organizations that you're well, talking about that do dominate a lot of the process. Um, but again, that, it does but those organizations are also heavily skewed. I mean, I've written a lot about civil society, and civil societies are by no means randomly uh, recruited, Absolutely. so to the speak. Associations <laughs> that dominate sure, go ahead. Well, we can come back to the online thing, because I want more time for the people. Um, I just have uh, maybe a couple... Hi, my name is Kubir. I'm a uh, student in political science department here. I just have maybe some reaction. I'm not quite sure if they're uh, coherent questions. But uh, when I hear uh, the, anything real existing democracy, and I'm thinking that what's uh, – uh, I mean, it really – points me that there, what is the normative basis of this, right? You know, if we think about all the democracies that recognize themselves and claim themselves to be democracy, so what is, uh, what are we arguing for here? Or what are we arguing about here? What's democracy? And I would like to hear about that what's uh, the sort of the normative standpoint of this uh, uh, discussion. And and I think reading and listening to some of the uh, conversation here, that even though you don't really explicitly mention it, but I think there is a, a, a normative uh, a foundation is that a government by the people uh, or government, some sort of participation, but uh, by the people in, in government. Uh, and so that's, I want to sort of have a, a clarification. And if I'm assuming that right, and there is a, sort of a notion of popular sovereignty associated with uh, democracy. So how do you, maybe, if, if it's there, if it's not, I'm just trying to figure out if you think about popular sovereignty as part of this democratic process. And if you think about popular or people, that's not just individual to me. It also thinks about collectivities and identities and nation. Uh, so uh, it's maybe something you would like to comment on that. And... If I'm not going too much, I just want to maybe turn, connect this question uh, or comment, concern to uh, Michael, uh, your um, comment about democratizing uh, uh, economy. And this is where I'm thinking that, you know, we, over the last 100 and 200 years, we have sort of both philosophically but in terms of process have sort of separated out economics and politics, economic and progressive process. So is... Uh, by de democratizing economy, you want to f first, in some way, establish popular sovereignty over uh, the economy. And um, before even we think about process of how people participate in it, I think the bigger question for me is that in, in whose name we are enacting this uh, political power or government power, before you even think about what are the various ways people do participate in it. So my question. Well, I mean, you put your finger on a very sensitive subject because that's exactly why I call it real existing democracy. It has no normative basis whatsoever as far as democratic theory is concerned because very much things that so-called democracies do are not necessarily coherent or consistent with that. Certainly not government by the people. These are government by politicians. That's not the same thing. Now, people may have some kind of a role in choosing them or supporting them or whatever it is, but the government of the real existing democracy is by politicians, right? Or representatives or whatever you want to call them, but politicians, right? The popular sovereignty is, a, is, a, is, is, as far as this is concerned, is a myth. It may be a useful one and people can get away with it. So the concept is a purely nominalistic concept. It simply says... There's a subset of countries that call themselves democratic. There are another subset of countries which have already called themselves democratic and gotten away with it. And incidentally, these days, 
you know, you're supposed to be democratic to be a member of the Council of Europe. You're supposed to be democratic to be a member. So there's even a kind of certification system, but it's loose, to put it mildly. But still, that's it, right? Now, I think that more or less empirically coincides with those famous seven criteria of Bob Dole, which he calls polyarchy, and he calls it polyarchy precisely because it's not popular sovereignty or government by the people. He wanted to get rid of the word democracy because it was misleading because of those historical associations. So I'm not making that something. Terry and I have worked on a, a piece we called What Democracy Is and Is Not, and we have what I would call a process. So the norm is not a value because I think democracies can pursue all kinds of different values. So the value is not there. It's the norm, and the norm is accountability. So holding rulers accountable for their decisions, but you do it through intermediaries, so-called politicians or representatives, right? So that's, that's the underlying common definition from the beginning, it seems to us. That's, but it's a process, not necessarily as I say, a norm in the value sense of that concept. Mike, did you want to comment? Yeah, just because I think, and that's a good place to diverge it from participatory democracy, because participatory democracy has always tried to align the distinction between ruler and ruled, and, uh, and, and aspired to something like self-determination or collective determination or self-governance, which in a sense is ruled out by that you know, social contract idea that we transfer all our legislative power you know, away from individual members to a, a governing class which again helps to explain the antipathy towards that political class by a lot of yeah. pursuers of democracy now. But um, the problem is the absence of a mechanism for holding the rulers accountable. So, as you well know, many of these participatory democracies are not binding in and by themselves. Some are binding, some are not binding, and they have, and also usually political authorities can overrule uh, um, these. So. Yeah, I, again, I think that just to, to, to stick with the one case of participatory budgeting, one of the interesting things that happens is that the monopoly on legislative f of power is broken. So if you look at Porto Alegre in New York, New York City, the way that it's done there, it is binding. So the, the, yeah. the, the proposals that are chosen, but in many other places it's not binding, for example, in Germany. These are recommendations from the people. Um, but then the normative grounding would be agency developed, you're developing your political agency through processes of, of collective determination. And it wouldn't be set up around accountability. It'd be set up around political agency right. and capability. That's the, uh, you're right. That's a big difference between yeah. the yeah. participatory and the yeah. what I'm calling process. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to go to Ira and then back to this. Uh,
um, uh, are you grappling with the central inherent um, uh, problems or with um, uh, what might be called a surrounding or second order problems? And the second question, if I may, I think is related, um, is if we were to go back 100 years, roughly, or say to the end of the war period in Europe, um, both the friends and enemies of democracy, and there certainly have been enemies of democracy, um, mounted the same case which was that because of the inherent flaws of adversarial democracy, they weren't saying this just the Soviets, of adversarial democracy, except perhaps the Soviets were in their own way, um, the uh, um, uh, democratic governments are simply incapable of solving big problems, managing capitalism, dealing with class, dealing with global power, etc. And my question then is whether today's conundrum are uh, of the same magnitude of, of those, um, or uh, possibly um, less of a magnitude. Uh, and therefore, the, the, the question therefore about the, whether the 28 solutions we're trying to get to leave, um, are solutions to something more peripheral than existed then, and whether they speak to the inherent question, um, whether 100 years ago or today that vexed democracies, and whether if we turn to They really substitutes for the adversarial form in in, in, in a in a world in which civil society is unequal, in which you have very different kinds of interests, in which friendship assumptions really can't apply. Um, so whether that too is more peripheral than central to current conundrum. Well, um, first in in the European discussion. Uh, the issue was almost never phrased as participatory. It's deliberative democracy, which is, a, I think, a rather different thing. But deliberative democracy is more of a distinctive model than participatory. All of the – so I uh, – It's based on a friendship assumption. What? It's based in some ways on a friendship assumption. Well, it it's based – no, we could – we could I – mean, but no. But what I – we do in this thing is we discuss three different models – numerical democracy, negotiative democracy, and deliberative democracy. And different ones of these things are aimed at these. And the basic idea is that a good democracy is a mix of all three. So it's a mistake to, so to speak, I mean, some are more one than the other. The underlying theme of the volume is that the mix is changing. And the main change is the decline in so-called numerical democracy, particularly the significance of elections, the role of political parties, uh, formation of government as the outcome of elections, etc. And it's negotiative democracy, which has become, and that's why so many of the proposals are focused on civil society organizations, et cetera, and creating different forums for the representation of denizen as opposed just to citizen industry. They're all in there, so to speak. So the, the, I think the general answer is, and it's been there since Aristotle, <laughs> mixed democracy. So you want a democracy of mixed principles. Then the question is, what is the kind of mix that, that is changing in part because of social structure? Etc., and the nature of citizenship itself is changing, and what is the best you can expect. But as I say, our purpose within the framework of stateness, if you see what I mean, not assuming that, 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 that it's an, uh, syndicalist as it was the old word for that, within the state, what is the mix of types of democracy that will best serve citizens' interest and the quality of decision-making? That was our purpose, I should say. Uh, well, huge question, but real quick, there are lots of spheres and layers of governance in which participatory democracy could do well. There are others that it can't. Um, the same is true of representative forms. The same is true of oligarchy, dictatorship. Every model has limitations and, and levels that it succeeds well at and doesn't succeed others. So that's not surprising. I mean, I think Mansbridge, which, you know, that book, Beyond Adversary Democracy, is a, a very important book and a great book. Um, I don't really like that dichotomy that she sets up, although I think it performs well in her case studies that she's looking at. But there's lots of other models besides friendship, especially the kind of intimate friendship that she describes in that book for participatory democracy. Yeah, I absolutely. mean, a worker co-op, Mondragon doesn't, you know, which is 130. No, but I, in our work on corporate, that's the, neg the negotiative. 
you make deals, yeah, right? Yeah. And you yeah. usually make those deals these days between organized interests, right? So, and that produces something like a momentary consensus, which in fact may prove legitimate or accepted as legitimate even by those who do not participate in it. That's the trick of representation. If representation is working well and the representatives negotiate a compromise, then the hope is that those who weren't at the table, so to speak, will accept that compromise as if they had been at the table. That's when representation works well. And the party aspect of it isn't working that way anymore. That's the the main conclusion of the volume. And, and what does that mean? Can you revive political parties? We try, we have a few suggestions, but we're not very optimistic about that. I mean, uh, so. Okay, we'll go on. Oh, my name is Yong Huan Bian. I'm political science. Um, uh, my question is about, um, I understand your solutions uh, mainly talk about how to strengthen the political representation or in, in national level of government. But in European democracy, I think the more problematic is democratic deficit at the European level of policymaking, such as mm -hmm. like austerity politics, how to deal with the Greek cases. And in those issues, um, I consider that there is a very weak European parliament and European level parties and European executive. I assume mostly important key questions can be decided by the summit meeting, European Council. Mm -hmm. So such as, I mean, the Socialist Party and, and you said that the Conservative Party, they, they become more similar and similar, but still the French president, Hollande, they, he opposed the austerity, but um, Merkel, a uh, German council, uh, she supported that. Then how, how can those, I mean, conflicting policy um, views can be decided? And uh, how do you uh, expect the prospect of um, the political representation and democracy at the European level, not only at the national level of politics? Well, there are two organiz organizational features. The one is captured by this EU concept of comitology. So most of what comes out of the EU and particularly anything that comes out of the Commission, is subject to an extremely lengthy set of committee representation and then discussed collectively in the Commission, and then it goes to the Council, and then from there it goes to the Parliament eventually. But by that time, not a hell of a lot the Parliament can do about it. So committee, government by committee, for normal business, for Abnormal business, the European Council, and also the Council of Ministers on crisis or other times, there's a secret organization. And in fact, there are two of them, which has never appeared on paper on any treaty or formal, or it's called call repair. It's the Committee of Permanent Representatives. They do everything. So by the time you talk to Merkel and who it is, it's already been discussed for I don't know how long by these permanent representatives of their government of the Council of Ministers and of the European Council. So underneath it all, I think they're called Sherpas sometimes when you have summit meetings or something, but think of permanent Sherpas in that. That's how it's done. So committees, more or less invisible, not publicly, this is all done behind a veil, <laughs> not of ignorance, but of, <laughs> you know, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and that's how those kind of institutions function. And the trick, of course, is that if you compose those committees well and everybody, so to speak, gets and then you rise, they think that the eventual decision will be enforceable, will be regarded as legitimate. So it's not, you know, there is voting in the Council of Ministers, not in the European Council, but the Council of Ministers. But it's, a, it's secret, and B, it's very rarely used because they try to this internal system to arrive at a prior consensus so by the time the council meets its foregone conclusion they already know what they're going to do All right. same with the European Council uh, okay I think we'll just take one or... hi uh, Matthew Alley um, 
I'm coming at this not as a political scientist or a student of democratic theory or politics uh, student, but um, I wanted you to know that your your talk was helpful to someone who's interested in you know philosophical, uh, ecological, and sustainability related matters. Mm-hmm. Um, the narratives really useful. This movement that you've laid out for us from. <clears throat> uh, you know, the various stages along the way to this nebulous thing we're calling governance. It's very helpful. Um, And then I was thinking about this. You said there were 28 suggestions, of which you gave us five. And I noticed that you you commented, you said, you know, random choice is the way to solve this. And three of the five, universal citizenship, the nota voting, which is really, it sure would be fun, um, and smart voting, each of these points directly to the voting booth. Um, and then the other two that you mentioned – That's uh, what I'm calling numerical democracy. Yeah, That's right. They're, they're the, you know, the lotteries uh, <laughs> and the public funding for new parties. Each of those point you know, one step away toward the voting booth again. And so these are, um, in a sense, reaching the political imagination by thinking statistically. And you know, the you know, popular political imagination, it's a matter of statistics. We've got to get the numbers to come out better. Mm-hmm. Are there any of the suggestions that you, uh, you, can, you and your group came up with that you would say point – the political imagination more directly towards structural yeah. issues, um, and if you could comment on that. So, thank well, you. I mean, the main thrust of several of those is on civil society and trying to ensure, as best possible, that there is a more equal distribution of organizational capacity across professions, sectors, causes, whatever it is. And the primary mechanism for that is this voucher system that I propose. So that each, this is, incidentally, this in part exists now in Europe. The Spaniards did it first, I think. In every tax declaration in Spain, you assign, I forgot whether it is auto per mille, I think it's called. In, in Italy, it's auto per mille. I can't remember. Eight, not eight percent, but, but, whatever it is, uh, a percentage of your taxes is assigned to institutions of civil society. In the Spanish case, it started out where you could give it to the church or the state working for various social causes. And then, of course, the problem was there was only one church, right? And then some people who were not members of that church got a little bit ups. So now you can give it to Protestants and Jews and a little, you know, But still, it started out as a simple dichotomy, the church with a capital C or the state with a capital S. And you would assign then social work. It was called obras sociales in in, in the Spanish term. Now in in Hungary, for example, and several others, this is now, there's five or six countries now where you can use your tax distribution to earmark proportions for specific groups. In fact, groups now... Advertise, and they, 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 you'll see it. If you drive around Europe, you'll see in some countries, you know, association of you know, the Red Cross, but also who knows what else, and they'll give, there'll be a number. As soon as you see a number, that's the number you fill in on your tax return, which gives a proportion of that tax return to civil society. So that was one idea, right? It would be to build a broader basis by allowing citizens who would be taxed for anyway, but who would, if they didn't, the money would just go into the the coffers of the state, but if they took the trouble, they could distribute to them. So that was one. And then there's a number of suggestions about specialized councils, particularly for a problem which in many ways is one of the most urgent problems in in Europe today, and that is the increasing number of non-citizens living in European countries, many of whom are not exactly legal, although there are maybe not as many as illegal in the United States, but still. Lots. And so the question was, you know, how can we guarantee represent well, – they're called denizens in European jargon. I don't know whether you use the term in this country too. And the question was, can you create specialized councils, so to speak, for denizens? And they vote. And, and I – in my commune, there is a council of denizens. I vote. And it's interesting. There's a Vietnamese party. There's a Moroccan party. And then, and then there's a mixed – the two mixed ones with sort of people from different nationalities – Albanian, there's an Albanian party, and you check, you know, on your, you know, on your, when you vote in local elections, you can check and vote for an Albanian party, a representative in the local council, and a, and a sub sort of part of the council. Could so, I just, yeah. I just want to um, get you back to my question about um, online, both deliberation and participation. Oh. 
Just yeah. if you have any comments on it, and then we'll close, or you don't have to say anything. But it seems in terms of Ira's uh, distinction, I really also would share Mike's reservations about the necessity of friendship. I don't want to push just participation at the expense of representation. I'm for both, and I think participation can sometimes address conflict as well, and representation sometimes consensus. Um, possibilities there and deliberation fits into all of it. But I think recently, at least in the United States and more globally, really the online interactions, crowdsourcing, um, various forms of participation were very online um, mobilization, especially for organizational purposes, but increasingly even deliberative contexts. I mean, you have Fishkin stuff, you know, it's just mostly, and it is by uh, statistical representation right. among among citizens, you have it in uh, British Columbia with the forums, um, deliberative forums, uh, that can also proceed online. I mean, I think that some of your suggestions mention that, and I don't think it's it's um, insignificant. So if you have any comments about any of those. Well, we were, we were very much involved in that simply because my co-author is one of the, the most important scholars working uh, on Alexandre Trexel from Geneva. And in fact, he's the, you, you now have electronic voting in, in many Swiss uh, cities and canton, the entire canton of Geneva, for example. Now you don't vote, you don't go to, you know, uh, physical places. You, you vote by, by electronic means. And yes, so there's, I think, five or six different proposals of how to do that. But I, I've written a piece uh, two years ago, I think, now, on exactly the theme you said. Is there another revolution, and is that this electronic revolution? So is the introduction of these electronic means of participation, uh, is that going to be one of the revolutions that's emerging, so to speak? And I end up saying no, that there's a lot of hype and a lot of exaggeration, and that the basic problem, and incidentally, this has also come up very much when I was teaching in, in Cairo, because this is very much part of the perception of the Egyptians, particularly Kyrenes, you know, secular urban uh, Egyptians, that uh, owes their revolution owes a great deal to this mobilization by by internet, etc. And the basic problem is, can you convert virtual forms of participation into permanent, organized forms of participation? And the answer turns out to be that's extremely difficult. And the second problem is all of the research I've seen suggests that people go on the Internet not to deliberate and to consult opposing opinions. They go on the Internet to be reinforced in their own prejudices. And so, if anything, the Internet seems to actually have a kind of, how should I put it, polarizing or, or divisive effect because people do not really deliberate on the, on the but Internet. But it would be easy to, get to hear from people affected at a distance via the internet in, say, global governance, so-called global uh, governance institutions. It would be easy to open their deliberations as to whether anybody would listen to what the global public has to yeah. say. Well, that would be interesting. No, I, mean, I, I don't deny that wouldn't be interesting. There would be a problem, again, of who would participate and then what kind yeah, of incentive exactly. structure you would have to have to make sure that it wasn't simply monopolized by the wealthy, the better educated, or, or whatever it is, and, and obviously internet use in itself. Although I must say, all of the data that Alexandre comes up with is the so-called digital divide is disappearing very quickly. So the, the idea that that was a permanent divide and therefore any talk about a digital democracy was... was exclusionary or, or whatever it is. No, apparently there's a huge, older people, for example, used to say, no, they don't. No, it's not true. I'm the one who doesn't, but everybody else does. All right, so there we is have a... the opportunity for real face-to-face -face interaction <laughs> with speakers on the fifth floor, so please uh, join us for the reception and join me in thanking you.